Today, we're fortunate to have Bill Anderson here. He is the CEO of Bear AG, which is, among other things, the manufacturer of Bear Aspirin. And uh, does anybody here not use Bear Aspirin? Anybody? Okay, so in case anybody needs it, I have here a Bear Aspirin. Okay. And Bill, by background, is a graduate of the University of Texas and a graduate as well of MIT, where he has a degree from the Sloan School and a master's in management and also a chemical engineer uh, degree. He is a chemical engineer by training from the University of Texas. He has had a number of different important positions in the corporate world, including the CEO of Genentech. And then he oversaw the large parts of Roche, which later, which eventually had bought uh, Genentech. And now he uh, was recruited not too long ago uh, to run uh, Bear AG. And he lives in Germany, where the company is headquartered, but he's lived in many other parts of Europe as well as the United States. So thank you for coming uh, here. Uh, what brings you to Washington, by the way? Oh, you know, opportunity to interact with policymakers, lawmakers, and, and talk about, uh, yeah, some, some progress that, that we think is important in the, in the agriculture space in terms of providing regulatory clarity for okay. uh, yeah, crop protection. So when you meet with members of Congress, is that in, in lifting, uh, you know, uplifting or <laughs> make you feel better about America or what? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I would say the, the individual members are, I, I generally find to be quite fine people, uh, and, but somehow the, the system's not working that well right now, is it? Uh, you've noticed, yes. Okay. <laughs> so um, let's talk about uh, Bayer for a moment. So uh, I'm not an expert in medicine, but uh, Bayer aspirin seems to be the, the most famous of the kind of uh, painkillers, but is aspirin something that Bayer invented? Actually, aspirin is, is something that Bayer invented. In fact, it's, it's a trade name. It's salicylic acid is the, is the molecule, and uh, aspirin is the, is the Bayer. Okay, so before product. Bayer invented aspirin for thousands of years, what did people do for painkillers? I think uh, they used a hammer. Right. Uh, um, okay, I thought that there, there were things that people used that was the equivalent of it, but Bayer... I, I'm not sure, to be honest. Okay, so anyway... I don't go that far back. Okay, well, I do. I think, I think it I was do. invented in 1897, I, okay. I think so. Okay, so um, is it better than something called Tylenol? Uh, you know, it's very difficult to compare medicines, of, especially of different categories or different classes. Uh, I, I had a little uh, mishap a few years ago, and I ended up not on aspirin or Tylenol, but on uh, the, the ingredient in America, it's called the leave. Um, and that's a product that Bayer makes. That's also. a product that Bayer makes. That was before I joined Bayer, but okay. uh, it, was a, it was definitely a very important product for me. Well, this is when you were skateboarding and you broke your femur. Uh, yes. And um, are you still skateboarding? or? Um, you know, I, it's funny. When, when I showed up at the hospital, the ambulance drivers actually had brought my skateboard along, and, and my wife was at the door. I, I broke my femur in four pieces. That, don't do that. I, I really wouldn't recommend it. Um, my wife saw the skateboard. Uh, the ambulance driver brought it in and said, oh, here's your skateboard. And my wife said, no, you take it. Uh, and, and then, but I held on to it. But afterwards, when I recovered and I, I started to skateboard a little bit, and then my wife said, you know, Bill, I, I think it's time to give it up. So, so, how old so no, you, I'm done. How old were you when you were skateboarding still? Um, how old was I? Let me think. 50, 55? Yeah. Really? Yeah, but I started when I was about five. Okay. And I had 50 years with no broken bones. So, you know. Okay. All right. So today, um, if you go to a hospital and you need a painkiller, you highly recommend that people give you a leave or bear or Tylenol or... It depends on what you need. The, the reason a leave was important to me is that it lasts 12 hours. And so if you're, if you're, you know, if you're trying to sleep through the night right. and your pain reliever is wearing off in four or five hours, then that's kind of tough. Okay. Um, you can try morphine too, but, uh, um, all right. So let me ask you, um, in the last 20 years or so, 30 years, doctors have said to avoid a heart attack, it might be a good idea to take a bare aspirin or an aspirin once a day. What do you think of that? Uh, I think if you're, if you're curious on the topic, you should talk to your doctor about it. 
I'm, I am a chemical engineer, but I'm not a doctor. Okay. What I, what I do know is what it's, it's, uh, it's known to prevent secondary events of a, a second heart attack, a second ischemic stroke. And, um, and so that's, that's where it's used the most. Okay, so um, today um, you manufacture bare uh, aspirin under, as part of the consumer division that your company has. You have three divisions, consumer, pharmaceutical, and you'll call crop science, let's say. Let's go through each of them. Okay. In consumer, what is it that you have as a product other than bare aspirin? Well, there's too many brands to name, but some that you would know of, uh, things like Alka-Seltzer, um, some of you might have used that occasionally uh, in, the, in the morning in particular, uh, but uh, other things like Aleve, Midol, Claritin for allergies. We have a, a new, a new uh, non-steroidal antihistamine that is, um, or sorry, uh, decongestant that, that's called Astapro. Um, and then there's a bunch of others. Okay, so how many different products do you have in the consumer area? Well, Thousand? No, but, but but hundreds. Hundreds. Because we be, because believe it or not, even though the world, uh, for example, there's Coca Cola in pretty much every country, but when it comes to consumer health, there's different brands and different products in different countries. It just evolved that way. So we have a very different portfolio in Germany than we have in Brazil or Japan or the U.S. Okay, how is the consumer business generally for companies like yours? Consumer products, which are ones you don't need a prescription for, is that a booming business or dying business or what it's it's a it's a good business um because it's a general trend towards people wanting to take care take care of themselves and uh without having to see a medical professional so it's it's been a you know a healthy growth area probably five six percent market growth for the last decade and the margins on that are better than or not as good as uh, pharmaceutical products they're generally lower than the, the patented, you know, kind of prescription medicine. Area. So if you have a prescription medicine um, and it's on patent, when it goes off patent, does that become a consumer product? Because anybody can buy it without a prescription or it, it's, you still need a prescription? Yeah, let, let me explain that. When, when it goes off patent, that doesn't affect the prescription status. Okay. So in order for it to become a consumer health medicine, it needs to go through what's called an RX to over-the-counter switch. And so a company has to provide evidence to regulators like the FDA that, hey, this medicine actually, you know, with certain labeling and, and such, it ought to be available over-the-counter. That, that now that we've had enough, maybe 20 years of use of this product, we know it well enough that it ought to be able okay. to be uh, purchased without a prescription. So most consumer uh, products that you sell and maybe similar companies, do you develop them yourself or do you basically buy them from somebody else because you make an acquisition? So if you look at ours, um, some of them were prescription medicines that we developed and others were prescription medicines that somebody else developed and sold, but then because we have a specialty in consumer health that we, we took it from, from um, prescription to over-the-counter ourselves. All right, so talk about pharmaceutical. In pharmaceutical, you're developing new drugs, typically that will require a prescription, um, but do you tend to develop them internally or do you do more acquisitions of people who've already developed these kind of products? Sure. We, we have some internal research and then we supplement that with quite a bit of sourcing outside because even the largest pharmaceutical companies they might have, I don't know, 1% of the innovation that's going on in, in life science in-house. That means 99% is going on somewhere else. And so you really need to supplement your internal research with what's going on in universities, what's going on in, in small companies. Yeah. Right. So what are your best known pharmaceutical products? Um, well, we have, uh, in, in, we have one that's the, the largest seller in the world, which is called Zarelto. And uh, anyone in here been on Zarelto? Nobody wants to admit it, but what, what does it do? Uh, is that a, yeah, it's not. It's actually, I, I say it because I, I ended up on it twice in, associated with my broken femur. Again, both times before I joined, joined Bear. It's, it's used to prevent blood clots. And oh. uh, in, for example, post surgery, uh, that in many a, a number of uses, but that's one of the most right. common ones. So, so some of you may have taken it, and you didn't want to raise your, you didn't want to raise your hand. It's okay. 
So but, pharmaceutical uh, products, um, what is the biggest focus now? Is it to prevent Alzheimer's? Is that one of the biggest things that new people, that people are doing in the pharmaceutical world is trying to come up with something for that? You know, there's a lot of research in Alzheimer's, uh, but there's, the bottom line is the, the, the biopharmaceutical industry has made tremendous progress on a lot of diseases right. over the last 30 years, but we still got a lot of diseases with a lot of room to go. And so it, it's really across the board, neurological diseases, cancers, uh, heart disease, diabetes. It, it's, it's a huge, okay. huge open field. Okay. What about uh, Viagra? You don't make an equivalent of that, right? Uh, no. You're not in that business? <laughs> nope. Okay. Not of interest or not profit? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's well satisfied. I don't know if I'd use the word satisfy, but okay. Um, okay, so let's talk about your other business, which is crop science. Now, um, for those who don't know, um, a number of years ago, before you were there, Bayer bought for $63 billion a company called Monsanto, which was a company that kind of re and made itself into an agricultural science company. Now your market cap is roughly 40 some billion dollars. So somebody spayed before you got there. They spent $63 billion and now they have that plus the rest of your company and all of it's together is worth 40 billion. So it couldn't have been a great acquisition, right? Mm. So you're saying you, you don't need a finance degree right. to understand Probably not. that. Yeah, yeah. But why did it become worth less than $63 billion? What was the biggest challenge that you have with Monsanto? Well, first off, let me just say the, the strategic rationale for that acquisition was brilliant because Bayer was a leading producer of crop protection chemicals and Monsanto was a leading producer of seeds and, and so-called traits. Traits are the things that allow you know, a plant to, to actually have insect resistance built in or um, to, to be tolerant to a herbicide. So Monsanto was leading in the one field, Bayer had very important leads in the other you put them together and you have an opportunity to bring to farmers sort of complete solutions. And, and we should talk some more about that because there's a lot of important future right. uses there. But uh, what went wrong? The, the biggest factor was uh, related to litigation on, on glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. And well, for uh, those who don't know, and a lot of people here are probably not in the, any farmers here? I don't think so. So um, if you're a farmer, you use Roundup, which is your brand name, for a product that, I guess, enables the crop to grow, but kills the weeds. And therefore, it makes it more efficient to grow the product. Why was Roundup um, the subject of so much litigation? Yeah, um, the, 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 the challenge uh, has been around some, some confusion about the safety of of glyphosate and basically uh, in fact it was announced earlier today as an example the European Union just extended the approval of glyphosate in the EU for another 10 years um, it's been uh, you know seal of approval by the EPA and the US Department of Agriculture since since its okay. origin um, but you know there there is a small proportion of of uh, people in this space of toxicology who, who think that it causes cancer. And um, again, the company, we think the evidence is, is super clear. This is a very safe okay. and very important agricultural right. chemical, but you know. Let's, say, let's suppose that's true. Why would you've paid out billions of dollars in settlements? Why pay out that much money if it's not true? Mm. Yeah. Um, I. I I think that's, that's sort of in the category of life's not fair. Right, okay, so you're continuing to use the product, you've paid lots of money out, but um, why is it so important to have this product? Uh, people grew products, agricultural products, for presumably thousands of years without this product. Why is it such a great product? Yeah, uh, I think it's pretty simple. If you, if you go back to the 1970s, 1980s, we had three and a half billion people in the world and you recall, those of you who are old enough to remember, uh, that we had quite a few famines. And uh, now we have 8 billion people in the world. And 
we have not solved the food security issues in the world, but we actually are in better shape today than we were then. And the, we don't have more land in cultivation. What we have is we have much better agricultural technology and glyphosate is, is probably the leading example of this where we, you know, we were able to engineer crops to be resistant to glyphosate. And basically you can take out the weeds and the crops thrive. And so the yields go up, we can feed the world, we can provide clothing through cotton and other things for the world. And, uh, and, and so this is an essential product. And, and many of you have heard of no-till farming as an example. No-till farming is now the, the standard practice in America, and that's enabled by glyphosate. You, you, you basically, you can't do it on the scale we do it without glyphosate. Right. So just to make it real, just two, two statistics. It's been recently estimated that without glyphosate in America, the, the cost of the average grocery bill for a family of four would go up by 48%, okay? Yeah. Or taking glyphosate out of, of agriculture in America would be the equivalent from a, from a carbon emission standpoint of putting 6.8 million additional cars on the road. Okay, so you're saying it's a good thing even though some lawyers don't like it so much. All right, so um, right now you had an earnings call not long ago, and in that earnings call, um, you said more or less, if I got it right, that you're, you were open to selling one of your three divisions or hiving one or more of them off. You have consumer, pharmaceutical, and crop science. So what did you mean by that? Are you thinking of selling one division or spinning it out? Or what can you say about that beyond what you've already said? Yeah, well, we, we, we have a challenge in that we have a company with approximately 50 billion in revenues. Uh, and this year our cash flow after litigation and settlements uh, re related to glyphosate uh, is, is essentially zero. And we have a fair amount of debt on the balance sheet that's associated with the, the acquisition of Monsanto. And we, um, yeah, we need to do something about that. And so we're, we're evaluating a number of things. Okay, and do you have a good investment banker helping you or something like that? Or are, they, are there enough investment bankers interested in advising you? Yeah, yeah, we, we've had no shortage of uh, volunteers. Okay, yeah. okay so uh, today um, your company is uh, competing against who? You're competing against other pharmaceutical companies, other consumer product companies, other crop science companies. Is there one major competitor or two that you have or no one company that you compete with? You know, it, it depends which division we're talking about, you know. Um, I think in our, our big competition is, and our big motivation is what we need to deliver for the world. You know, for, for example, we have 8 billion people today and we haven't solved food security for the world. We're gonna have 10 billion people by 2050 and we're gonna have less water, we're gonna have less land um, and we gotta feed those 10 billion people. And, and so our crop science folks are, are working overtime. We're the, we're the leading R&D investor in agriculture in the world. Uh, All right. We've got to solve that. All right. So I'm not obviously an agriculture expert or a farmer by background. You can probably figure that out. So um, why is it so bad to have weeds if you have a product, you're growing a crop, and you have some, a few weeds? Uh, why is that so bad? Yeah. Um, basically, weeds grow better than crops. And, and if, you, if you don't deal with the weeds, Depending on the country, you, you can lose 80, 90 percent of your yield. Um, it, it depends, again, different climates, but if, if you're in Texas or you're in Brazil, uh, okay. your, your crops don't have a chance. What about pesticides? That, what your product is is different than a pesticide because it's not killing bugs or killing weeds, right? Yeah. There, there, you can think about three categories in general. Uh, the things that take out crops are weeds, insects, and fungi. Um, and so you have fungicides, insecticides, and, and herbicides. And, we, and we, we deal with all three of those. Okay, so you do pesticides as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, today, when you're in Washington, D.C., you, 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 are there particular regulations or legislation you're trying to get Congress to do or administration to do? Yeah. Let me describe a world and you can see what our, what our audience thinks about this. Imagine you had a, a situation in the US where companies spend 10 years and, and $2 billion to approve a new medicine. 
and the FDA approves the label, and, um, and you, you take it out to, to patients and doctors around the country, but then states start to say, eh, actually, we don't like the FDA label. But we're going to give it a different label in our state. And uh, you know, the FDA says it's effective for this, but Texas says, no, it's not effective for that. And California says something else. Um, you know, that, that not only would create chaos in the market, but it would provide an uncertainty that would prevent future medicines from being developed. Okay? I think hopefully most of us could agree that that would be a bad system. That's the system we have today um, in, in the case of herbicides. And in the United States. In the United what States. about in Europe? This is, this is a uniquely American problem. Oh, so Europe is easy to deal with? Uh, there's other challenges in Europe. Okay. But, but the idea that you know, we have an EPA-approved label, and then, oh, we got to deal with a label from a state that says something that's not just different or, or sort of complementary, but is contradictory. Okay. All right, so you're now an American who is living in Germany. Do you speak German? Uh, it depends on who you ask. Okay. Well, how about the German executives in your company? Um, well, I'll put it this way. Before April of this year, I, I didn't speak German, and and now um, I'm I'm getting by. So okay. yeah. So your board meetings or other things are in German, and how do you yeah. keep up with what's going on? Uh, I listen. Oh, but you can understand German. Yeah, I'm I'm am ge getting pretty good at it. It's 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 hard work. I, I had to do this early in my career. I, I learned French for a job I had in Belgium, and okay. so I know what it takes. Uh, it's a lot of hard work, and but it. it it pays off. So and speaking of paying off, in the um, United States, the CEOs of American companies are criticized sometimes for getting such high pay compared to the lowest paid worker in the organization. Uh, that criticism isn't as leveled as much against European CEOs. So are you on the European CEO compensation model or the American <laughs> CEO compensation model? Uh, I'm, I'm on the European compensation model. Um, so how would you get yourself converted to the American one? You, and you thought about moving the company to America? Or? I, I mean, in, in Europe, there's an idea of social cohesion that, frankly, I think that's a pretty important concept. And, um, you know, it, look, I think we all have to ask ourselves about um, what, you know, what is reasonable in, in compensation. And, and I think, frankly, I think one of the reasons that uh, that we've lost the confidence of working people in many cases is that they, you know, they they don't sense that the system is fair. Uh, so, you know, I, I just look, and I, I don't claim any moral high ground on this, but I just think it's a topic we all we all ought to be thinking about. Okay, so you were president and CEO of Genentech for a while, and that was one of the first, if not the first, a biotech publicly traded company. It was the first. What did they actually develop that was so revolutionary? Oh, there, there were a number of things that were developed before I got there that were, um, you know, the, the, probably the biggest breakthroughs were, were uh, three big cancer medicines that had huge effect in uh, lymphoma, in breast cancer, and then one called the Vastin that, that covered a number of different types of tumors. And, and then more recently, while I was there, we developed the leading therapy for multiple sclerosis, leading therapy for hemophilia A, uh, leading therapy for uh, spinal muscular atrophy, some, some uh, really serious diseases. Okay, and so um, you ran that company, and then you, was it you that decided to sell it to um, Roche? No, that, that, that happened before I was CEO. Okay, yeah. so you were, you were the head of Genentech. They sold, they'd already sold it to Roche. Yeah. And then you, but you moved to Switzerland? To... I did, I did. And what was that like? Uh, you know, it was a very, very important learning experience. And I know m members of the audience have lived in different countries. One thing I observe is, in particular with the small countries, like uh, we lived in Switzerland, my daughter lives in Singapore, there's this concept called uh, too small to fail. And if you haven't heard of it, just think about it a little and what that means. And then how does that apply to what we see going on in America today? Do you know, people in a country like Switzerland uh, they've been surrounded by often hostile nations for their, their whole history for 400 years. 
people in Switzerland don't get up in the morning and think there'll always be a Switzerland. They think, what are we going to do today to make sure that we can preserve our country? And, uh, and, and that's true in Singapore as well. And, and these countries, the smaller countries, they, they, they put what's good for the country first. And then, you know, of course, there's differences of opinion about how to best accomplish various goals. But, um, but they have learned the discipline of putting right. the country first. And you don't, do you think our members of Congress do that too? I, you know, I, I used to blame politicians, okay? But then I realized, hey, this is a democracy. You know, it's kind of hypocritical to blame politicians if you're in a democracy and things aren't going well. It's not the politicians' fault. It's the fault of the voters or the... Well, you know, we, we all make decisions every day. And I, I would say, for me, the, the most significant one, uh, this, this was, I think Solzhenitsyn said, the line between good and evil doesn't run between you and me. It runs right through the middle of each of us. And I think if, if we have a political situation where the other side is the enemy, or the other side is evil, or the other side is beyond the pale, right. that's totally toxic. And that's not what America was based on. And, you know, I think the people of America are going to have to wake up to this. So uh, are you've had a very distinguished corporate career, and hopefully if you can solve the Roundup problem, you'll have an even more distinguished corporate career. But have you ever thought about doing something really helpful to the country by going into government or public service? Hmm. You know, it's funny. I, I have a really bad track record at thinking about what I'm, of, of, of thinking what I'm going to be doing in the future. You know, for example, a year ago, I had no inkling that I would be living in Germany, um, speaking German, uh, you know, working in, in crop science. Right. Uh, and so I, I yeah, I, I, try to, I try to make the most of each day and-, and uh, So you, when you called your wife and said, we're moving to Germany, what did she say? Hmm. Uh, it, was, it was very quiet for a while. No, my, my wife is amazing. I mean, we, we've, we've moved 13 times. We've lived in, this is our sixth country. We've raised three kids in that and um she's yeah she's total rock star and and uh and she said you know basically what i said we we didn't have a good excuse not to go we thought hey this is an opportunity to to partner with a hundred thousand great men and women that are that are doing an important mission and how could we not do that and the fact that it's an inconvenience to move and all that um you know that's that's kind of a lame, for us, that would be an a lame excuse. We said, we got to do it. Okay. So she's worked out. Yeah. Right? Okay. Oh. <laughs> All right. And um, you're not likely to leave this position anytime soon because you just got it. But when you were, got the position, did they tell you you had all these problems with Roundup and you were going to be doing litigation? And did you know all that when you took this position? Sure. Oh, yeah. And, I knew about it. And didn't bother you? You know, um, I guess for me, a, a lot of what's interesting in, in life is uh, to, to make the best of a situation, you know, and to, right. and so to try your, to, yeah. Your market cap is roughly $40 billion. Suppose somebody came along and said, we'll pay you $50 billion for the whole company. You wouldn't sell the whole company and just let somebody else, no, you wouldn't. No way, that. no way. Oh, no, no, no. We, 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 have, uh, we have an amazing future, and th that would be... Yeah, that would be the deep, that, that would be the bargain of the century. Okay, so and is buying your stock a bargain of the century? Would you say would, would that be a good investment for me if I wanted to buy your stock now? Because you're probably going to do hey, pretty well. Uh, yeah, I, I I think we're we've got a great mission. We're gonna we're gonna bring really important products in human health, in feeding the world. Uh, we're, we've got things going on that are amazing in terms of. Uh, carbon sequestration in the fields to short stature corn to increase yields and to decrease water use. We're, we're looking at renewable aviation fuels out of, out of uh, crop seeds that can be grown between other crops. I mean, it's, yeah, what we're doing, we, we, we have novel cell therapy for Parkinson's disease. We showed phase one data recently. It's, it's amazing, producing, you know, dopamine producing cells 
inserted in, in the brains of, of people with Parkinson's. Uh, we're just getting started, 160 years young. Okay, so um, as you now, you're part of a European company, is it easier to be part of a European company when you're going around the world than to be a part of an American company? Because America has maybe a few more enemies than Europe has, or does it make a difference? I, I don't think it makes such a difference. I think the, you know, what, what, what is a European company? What is an American company? You know, we have, we have 20,000 employees in America. We have a lot of our most important R&D is happening in America. Um, I've worked for American companies, uh, been based in Europe working for an American company. I've been in America working for a European company. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's... Doesn't make a difference. I don't think it makes much difference. Okay, and so as being a corporate CEO, how much time are you on the road traveling now? Um, I don't know, 30%. And um, you find that uh, you're meeting with employees, you're meeting with uh, customers or government regulators. Who are you mostly meeting with? That group. Uh, I, I have to say, I don't, I don't view my role as mostly being out there, kind of pressing the flesh, you know, right. meeting customers and things. I need to stay informed, but um, my role is, is to help the company be more effective. And if I'm flying around the world all the time, I'm not really helping the company be more effective. You know, uh, it, it, it's much more working with, with leaders across the company on how do, you, how do you take out the bureaucracy and unleash the power of the people doing the work. Okay, so when you uh, think about the message you wanna to convey to people, what is it about your company? You wanna to convey to people that Bear AG has been around 149 years or that it's uh, got a problem with Roundup but it's not that big a problem. What is the main message you wanna to convey to people? Uh, I, I think I, I would say two things. That first, this is a very important company for the future of, um, yeah, uh, being able to feed the world and do it in a more sustainable way, bringing important cures for significant diseases and helping people kind of take care of their own healthcare needs. But it's also a company that is going to be, we hope, a, a case study in uh, really streamlining the, the work of, of a 100,000 person organization getting, because big companies, and, and I've worked for a number of large companies, tend to be slow. And, uh, and that's, that's a problem. And, and frankly, it's a, it's a problem for customers, but it's a problem for employees as, you know, who wants to work, by the way, our, our, our kids, they don't wanna go to work for big, slow bureaucratic companies with 10 layers. You know, they wanna go somewhere where there's action and where people, you know, the people doing the work are making the decisions. And we're gonna do that at Bayer. So how many employees do you have total? 100,000. 100,000. How many of them come to the office and actually work out of the office? Uh, well, of course we have lots of people that are in the field. You know, when you're, when you're selling uh, to farmers right. and you're, you're servicing farmers, you have lots of people that are basically out on the farm. Uh, so of the people who are office-based, I think probably people are spending three or four days a week in the office. And what do you do about uh, um, ESG and climate change? Is your company trying to do something to reduce your carbon footprint? Um, absolutely. We're doing the same kinds of things that other companies are doing in terms of, uh, yeah, trying to be more energy efficient, that sort of thing. But way beyond that, I mean, our, our impact in the agriculture space is tremendous. I mean, you understand ag agriculture is a major source of global warming, but it also can be a major part of the solutions. You know, take something like, um, how do we do renewable aviation fuel? I mean, that's going to be an agriculture-based solution, most likely, um, but we, we need, innovation there you know we we're probably going to need some novel oil seeds right to do that and uh, and that's where Bayer comes in so um if you're in the agriculture business do you like grow your own tomatoes in your backyard or just to kind of experiment with agriculture you do any agriculture farming yourself uh actually i i i am a, a hobbyist gardener 
but I, but I'm, I hate to say it, I don't grow a lot of vegetables, more, more uh, tree, you know, tree fruits and things like that. Yeah. All right, so you're not gonna branch out into the other areas in your farming? Uh, pro probably don't have time for it. Okay, so today, um, you um, would say your biggest challenge as a company is to grow the market value and have people just not pay this much attention to the crop science litigation problem? Is that what you say your biggest challenge is? Uh, I, th I, think we, I think we have to solve the, the issue at the root on, on the litigation thing. Um, and, and frankly, that, that's a big problem for America. You know, we're, we're not the only large company that is the, the focus of the attacks. Uh, and this is, a, this is a highly sophisticated thing. You know, the, the, um, the tort lawyers are raising somewhere between three and five billion a year in, in private equity. Um, and not for me, but uh, no, that's I, but you know, the, this is, this is a challenge, right? That, that, uh, you're saying what they do is, uh, there, uh, there are law firms that basically raise money from, uh, f investors designed to fund the lawsuit expenses and they get a cut of the uh, recovery more yeah. or less. Right. Yeah. And, and for example, you don't have to win every case if you're in that business. You just need to win the occasional case and get, you know, some astronomical jury award, and then that's enough to bring big companies to their knees. And um, you know, this is a uniquely American phenomenon, and it's going to be a problem for American industry. This and, is, uh, this is you, not going away. You typically settle these cases, or do you take them to a jury? Uh, it's it's complicated, and I, I won't get into our legal strategy, but uh, yeah. All right, so you don't have this problem in Europe or you don't have this problem in Asia in terms of this kind of litigation? It doesn't exist there so, so much. So other countries have product liability uh, law, but the, the uniquely American part is, is really the scale of things and the, and the size of the awards and, um, and just what that, what that does in terms of fueling an industry. Okay, so... Um, this doesn't discourage you from wanting to sell more products in the U.S. because it's such a big market. I assume you just have to live with the cost of doing it. Well, I, I think it is a, a barrier to future innovation. You know, if you it's it's back to that regulatory regime that I mentioned. If if you have an unsteady regulatory regime in a nation, and this is a, a relatively new phenomenon, for for 50 years, FIFRA meant that you know that you had a federal um, standard and that that was the standard but that's been undermined in the courts in recent years and and there's an opportunity to clarify that you know legislatively um, but uh, but right now we're, we're we're dealing with that unstable regulatory regime and that that's a problem for the industry it's a problem for farmers for growers it, it's okay. yeah so you've said you've hired some investment bankers i guess lots of other consultants to figure out what to do sell things not sell things how long do you think it'll take before you come to a decision on this um, we, we've said we'll, we'll provide an update on, on what we think the best plans are in March. And, uh, but we'll, we'll continue to evaluate all our options. You know, we, so, we have to be open. So when you do earnings calls, as you did recently, um, I, you didn't blame your predecessors particularly. I would have done that. I'd say they made this acquisition. I didn't do that. Um, so how do you avoid uh, blaming your predecessors? Or why do you just say, look, it's not my fault this problem exists or you... you that's not your approach. That's what I would do. Um, you probably wouldn't. You're. you're uh, you, you don't look, know me, but I would guess. Look, yes, <laughs> Monday morning quarterbacking is not a positive term. Really? You know, it's 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 always easy to say, well, I wouldn't have done that, but you don't really know if you would have done that because you weren't there, and and so I I, I don't I don't get into that business. I I deal with you know what. what what are the facts, the situation before us today, and, and how do we you know, make the best of that? So um, on consumer products, I don't know you're that familiar with the U.S. drugstores, but if you go into a U.S. drugstore today, everything is under lock and key. Um, I don't know whether bear aspirin is, but virtually everything else. Is that a problem in, in terms of selling things now? And is this a problem in other countries where you have everything under lock and key and you've got to go get somebody to open a thing for you can buy a razor blade? Uh, I, yeah, it's not a, it's not a common problem outside of America. And, and from my experience, it's not a common, 
it, it's not a universal problem in America. It, it has maybe to do with uh, um, local practices in, in terms of law enforcement and prosecution and the various. But that's not problems. a big problem for your consumer products that, that drug stores are having so many things are lock and key. People get discouraged from going in and buying things. I think it's a it's a problem for our customers that are the drug stores and and they're unfortunately they're they're closing stores in a lot of locations and yeah I I I think that's a that's a problem for our country. Right. So let's suppose I want to buy some bare aspirin and I go in to buy it and it's not under lock and key and I can get it but somebody who works at the drug store says, you know, we have this generic it doesn't say bear but it's actually manufactured by the same people it just has a bear name on it. Is that a, it, it, does that happen a lot? Do you have generics for bare aspirin? Uh, yeah, there's, there's. And do uh, you manufacture the generic as yourself? Um, I don't think so. I'm, I'm, I haven't learned the whole supply chain of all our products uh, yet. Maybe I never will learn all of it, but um, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of things that go into that decision. And you make that decision when you go to the drug store and I make that decision when I go. And um, I did read a very interesting book a few years ago, if you're if you're interested in the topic called Bottle of Lies, uh, which was uh, I'd say pretty eye opening. Is that about Washington or what? It's <laughs> no, it 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 it's about some challenges that that uh, have occurred in okay. in the generic uh, space. Right. But yeah. So if you if you go into a drugstore yourself and you're buying things, do you ever buy the generic and just hope nobody notices you're buying the generic, or <laughs> that doesn't happen? You know. Uh, it depends on a number of things. What's the what's the price difference? What what am I buying it for? You know, how, how much do I care? Uh, but the, the truth is, the generic is made, I assume, by the same company. Sometimes that makes the branded product. There's no real difference, or is there really a difference? You give a little something extra for the name, bear. The again, there's a, many types of medicines. There's biologics, there's chemicals, um, there's different formulations. So, so for example, sometimes the, the, the reason you're buying a particular medicine isn't because of the active ingredient, but because you have some sort of time release formulation, right? right? And the generic may or may not be doing the same thing. So it, it's, it's complicated. Okay. There's not a single answer. So when you go to a drugstore, do you, you go to the checkout counter, do you say, you know, I'm the CEO of Bayer Aspirin or you don't tell people when you're checking out. I mean, just to maybe impress them with your knowledge of the products you're buying. Um, I don't think they'd be very impressed. Really? Nah. Even in Germany, they wouldn't be impressed. You're the head of Bear AG. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. I would be impressed, but okay. All right. So you're glad you took this job, right? Oh yeah. And you're glad you agreed to this interview, right? Uh, I, I have to think about that. <laughs> okay. So, um, well, look. Um, this is, uh, look, the truth is you, you've got a difficult problem, obviously, you know, and you knew this before you took over the company. Um, I wish you the best in doing it. It's not easy because of the litigation problems, but the uh, company uh, does make some really good products. And this is, uh, I guess, one of the very good ones. This is low dose. The low dose is safety coated aspirin regimen. So why do I need a safety coated one? Why not just, I mean, if it's not safety coated, is it unsafe or what? <laughs> I think you'll have to ask your doctor. Oh, okay. Oh, well, okay. Um, all right. So it's low dose. So low dose is better than high dose, I guess, right? Depends. Depends on what you're you taking. Ask it your for. doctor. All right. Yep. All right. Well, I'm going to go back and ask my doctor. I'm, I'm going to return this and get the generic. Maybe I don't know. But um, <laughs> see. Um, but I appreciate your coming all the way from Germany uh, to uh, listen to us, and uh, you're going to be meeting some members of Congress today, and. Um, you're going to tell them that they should do give away free samples of bear aspirin. You're not allowed to do that. The members uh, generally that. Yeah, I don't think they don't do, do that. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let me give you a gift. I want to thank you for your conversation. And let me give you a little gift here. David. Okay. This is a map of the district of Columbia. Thank you very much. Pose right there. Ah.